people will sometimes say, why does Ukraine matter? It matters because Putin is trying to put the band back together. He wants the old Soviet Union back. The former KGB officer long has lamented the collapse of the Soviet Union and dreamed of piecing it back together. He's talked about reuniting the greater Soviet Union. Karina, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to talk a little bit about your background first. Now, you were born in Ukraine and you immigrated to the United States when you were just eight years old. And at the time, Ukraine was under Soviet rule. We've been hearing uh, constantly over the last couple of weeks that President Putin wants to rebuild the former Soviet Union. What's it like to see this, um, to see th this Russian president, pre President uh, Putin, inch closer and closer to potentially rebuilding uh, what you escaped from? Right. And uh, so it's, it's one of the scariest things to watch, but it's also really sad because the people of Ukraine have been pleading with us, the US, for a while now um, to, to get the support and the help that they need to deter this situation from even happening in the first place. So for some context and to put things into perspective, this situation did not happen overnight. We had intelligence for months about what was being planned, that Russia was going to invade Ukraine, and we had a number of different scenarios that could have played out with the least likely scenario at the time being a full on invasion. But despite having the, the resources of the intelligence community and the time that we had to put sanctions and other um, actions in place in order to deter this from happening, this unlikely scenario, the administration decided to take very little action. And so, the worst, probably, the worst possible scenario that could have played out is exactly what we're seeing right now. And so anything we do at this point is too little too late. The invasion is happening. It's unfolding it um, right in front of us in real time. We're seeing um, the strength and resilience of the Ukrainian people as they fight against Russia and trying to maintain their um, independence in Ukraine. It's been really amazing to watch since the invasion happened uh, about a week ago, the resistance and you talked about, um, you know, the resistance of the Ukrainian people pushing back against Russian forces. Um, we've been seeing videos, whether it's on Twitter or, um, you know, news outlets are reporting just the determination and even the Ukrainian president, uh, you know, being able to stand up to Russia um, has really been inspiring. I know President Biden talked about that last night um, during his State of the Union speech. And I wanted to talk more about this resistance that we're seeing throughout the world, um, specifically with companies. This Reuters uh, article kind of goes through different companies that are pushing back. Either they're not doing business directly in Russia, they're pulling um, or limiting, uh, you know, the business that they're doing there. Do you think we're seeing any impact from this uh, boycott, essentially, of Russia yet from these companies? And if not, you know, how long do you think it will take to start really hurting uh, in Russia? Right. So absolutely. I mean, it's, it's great to see that companies, these big companies are stepping up to the plate. And again, we should have been doing this before the invasion even occurred. And so the things that we could have done that we should have been doing is now kind of, a, you know, we must do those things. And so what we should be doing as the U.S. is not sending troops into Ukraine because we don't want to trigger a World War III, but we should be assisting the NATO countries in um, preparing uh, their security, in sending troops and weapons to deter Russia, um, safeguarding the Ukrainian people. There's a lot of people that have uh, immigrated or moved um, out of uh, Ukraine uh, during this conflict. And there are five friendly countries that border Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those uh, Ukrainian people have now uh, become refugees there. So what we can do is support more of those um, humanitarian efforts in the NATO uh, countries that the uh, Ukrainian refugees had fled to. But what we need to be doing is really showing, putting action into place that we haven't been doing prior to this occurring 
is to show that the Putin, that we understand what's at stake and we're willing to do anything that we need to do to prevent the full on invasion from, from actually from Putin taking over uh, Ukraine and putting in a pro-Russian government and a pro-Russian puppet government that eventually would not allow us to help the Ukraine because it would then become a Russian um, entity. And just to talk more about what's at stake here, I mean, we've been seeing these reports and um, these these um, arguments that President Putin won't stop in Ukraine, right? He's gonna keep going and spreading his power and, and keep invading countries. Do you believe that he will keep going if he isn't stopped? Look, he is, he is a uh, he's a player, right? He's a chess player, and he's going to strategize whatever he needs to strategize in order to um, to get what he wants, and that's power, and that's recreating the Soviet Union. And so, you know, you look at what we should be doing with countries like NATO, right? And we should be supporting them. But ultimately, the countries that are part of NATO or want to join NATO should have the right to decide to do that on their own. And NATO should be in charge of figuring out if they meet the criteria and the requirements to be part of um, the NATO alliance. And if other countries in the Eastern Bloc wish to join NATO, they should be able to do that um, freely. So just to talk more about your congressional run uh, right here in the 8th District in Virginia, um, I was reading more about it and it hasn't been held by a Republican since Ronald Reagan was president. In the 2021 uh, governor's race, uh, it went for uh, Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat candidate. Can you talk about some of your strategies um, in terms of sort of uh, addressing the issues of maybe Democrat voters or independent voters uh, to get them on your side? So as you've mentioned, um, this seat has not been held by a Republican since the Reagan era. It's also never been held by a woman. And I feel with my background and my diverse background, growing up in the Soviet Union, uh, seeing how the world works and having a lot of international background, having national defense background for over a decade, being able to live the American dream and truly live it as a refugee, I think gives me a completely different perspective. And I think Virginia and especially Northern Virginia is ready for change. And we've seen that with Youngkin last year. We continue to see the independents and the Democrats slowly starting to uh, move their way towards the moderate perspectives. And I think because of what's been happening with the, this administration in the last year, people are starting to wake up. So right now the biggest challenges facing the 8th district are education and parental rights. And I understand the power of education. I went to public school and I ended up getting a master's degree from Johns Hopkins. So this district has the best public school systems in the entire nation and we cannot lower the standards for the sake of politics. And that's what some of these people want to do. And so we cannot let Baltimore uh, public school systems slowly seep into the Northern Virginia public school systems because we've seen the tragedies that, um, that happen there. Secondly, the crime continues rising in our neighborhoods. And I am a huge supporter of the police and ensuring that they have the necessary resources to keep us all safe. Uh, the police contribute to eliminating crime like domestic violence, theft, drugs, human trafficking, all of which we see here in Virginia, and especially the 8th District. And without their intervention, crime would be out of control. So we need to fight those voices that call to defund the police and ensure that our men and women in, their, in the uniform are getting the resources they need in order to keep us all safe. And third, we need to keep this inflation under control. It's the highest it's been in 40 years. And we can't keep printing money. We can't keep taking on debt. Families are suffering. They're trying to make ends meet. They're struggling. We're experiencing negative impacts of inflation 
as you can see in your grocery bill, your retirement accounts, at the gas pumps. So we need more sensible and fiscally responsible policies that reduce taxes and make our district more affordable. And just one last uh, note that I, I wanted to leave our audience with. Um, as a Ukrainian American, do you have a message for the Biden administration in the midst of this war um, that we're seeing between Ukraine and Russia? So I want to first uh, tell the Ukrainian people that we have their, we are supporting them and we stand by them, we stand behind them, we stand with them and to continue fighting the fight but for the Biden administration, I think we need to take a more aggressive approach. We need to continue showing strength against Putin. We cannot lay down and let him walk all over us. The only way to deal with a bully is to show strength. And that's exactly what we need to do. Karina, thank you so much for joining me today. If people want to learn more about your campaign and follow you ahead of the uh, Republican convention on May 21st, how can they do that? To support me and to learn more about my campaign, uh, please visit my website at KarinaForCongress.com. Thank you so much for having me.